Go Ask Alice, page 116. Dear Diary, I couldn't sleep, so I've been wandering the streets. I look kind of square because I don't want to seem weird when my parents get here. I've got my hair tied back in a ponytail, and I traded clothes with the most conservative girl I could find, and I'm wearing an old pair of white tennies I found in the gutter. At first, the kids I talked to in the coffee house seemed a little uptight because of the way I looked, but when I told them I'd called my folks to come and get me, they all seemed glad. It seems inconceivable that all the time Chris and I were in Berkeley, we didn't find out anything about any of the kids. It was just one big tearing down everything and everybody vacuum. Tonight I learned about Mike and Marie and Heidi and Lilek and many others. I'll probably use up the rest of the pages writing about them, but that's good because I want to get a fresh new clean book when I get home. You, dear diary, will be my past. Then one I will buy when we get home will be my future. So now I must hurry and write about the people I have met just this night. It simply amazes me that so many parents and kids have trouble over their hair. My parents were always bugging me about mine. They wanted me to curl it or cut it or get it out of my eyes or tie it back, etc., etc. Sometimes I think that was our biggest bone of contention. I met Mike at the coffee house and after explaining my situation and my current curiosity about why kids run away, he became very communicative and told me that hair had been one of his problems too. In fact, his dad had become so angry that twice he had forcibly shaved his head and sideburns. Mike said his parents were taking away all of his freedom and power of decision. He was becoming dehumanized, mechanized, forced into the mold of his father. He was not even allowed to decide which classes he wanted to take in school. He said he wanted art, but his parents thought only weaklings and bums were artists. Finally, he ran away to preserve his personality and sanity. So I told Mike about the church and their efforts to bring about a new and human arrangement between my parents and me. I hope he goes there. Then I talked to Alice, who I met just sitting stoned on the curb. She didn't know whether she was running away from something or running to something, but she admitted that deep in her heart she wanted to go home. The others I talked to, the ones who had homes, all seemed to want to go back, but felt they couldn't because that would mean giving up their identity. It made me think about the hundreds of thousands of kids who have run away and are wandering around all over the place. Where do they come from? Where do they even manage to crash for the night? Most of them don't have any money and don't have anywhere to go. I think I'll go into child guidance when I get out of school, or maybe I should become a psychologist. At least I'd be able to understand where kids are at, and maybe that would help compensate for what I've done to my family and myself. Perhaps it was even right for me to go through all this suffering so that I could be more understanding and tolerant of the rest of humanity. Oh, dear, wonderful, trusting, friendly diary. That's exactly what I'll do. I'll spend the rest of my life helping people who are just like me. I feel so good and happy. I finally have something to do for the rest of my life. Wow. I'm through with drugs too. I've used the hard stuff only a few times and I don't like it. I don't like any of it. The uppers or the downers. I'm through with the whole mess. Absolutely and completely and forever. Really, I am. Later. I have just read the stuff I wrote in the last few weeks and I am being drowned in my own tears, suffocated, submerged, inundated, overpowered. They are a lie. A bitter, evil, cursed lie. I could never have written things like that. I could never have done things like that. It was another person, someone else. It must have been. It had to be. Someone evil and foul and degenerate wrote in my book, took over my life. Yes, they did. They did. But even as I write, I know I'm telling even a bigger lie. Or am I? Has my mind been damaged? Was it really just a nightmare and it seems real? I think I've mixed up things which are true and things which are not. All of it couldn't be true. I must be insane. I have lamented until I am dehydrated, but calling myself a wretched fool, a beggarly, worthless, miserable, paltry, mean, pitiful, unfortunate, woe-begone, tormented, afflicted, shabby, 
disreputable, deplorable human being isn't going to help me either. I have two choices. I must either commit suicide or try to rectify my life by helping others. That is the path I must take, for I cannot bring further disgrace and suffering upon my family. There is nothing more to say, dear diary, except I love you and I love life and I love God. Oh, I do. I really do. Diary number two, April 6th. What a wonderful time to start a new diary and a new life. It is spring. I am home again with my family. Gran and Gramps will be here for another reunion with the prodigal daughter. Tim and Alex are just themselves and nothing could be better. I don't remember who wrote God is in his heaven and all's right with the world, but that is exactly the way I feel. Anyone who has desperately needed to come home knows what a tremendous feeling it is to be lying in his own bed. My pillow, my mattress, my old silver hand mirror. It all seems so permanent, so old and new at the same time, but I wonder if I will ever feel completely new again, or will I spend the rest of my life feeling like a walking disease? When I go into counseling, I'm really going to try to make kids see that getting into drugs simply isn't worth the bullshit. Sure, it's great and groovy going on trips. I will never be able to say it isn't. It's exact. It's exciting and colorful and dangerous, but it isn't worth it. It simply isn't worth it. Every day for the rest of my life, I shall dread weakening again and becoming something I simply do not want to be. I'll have to fight it every day of my life, and I hope God will help me. I hope I haven't ruined everyone's life by coming home. I hope Tim and Alex wouldn't be better off if I stayed away. April 7th. Today, Tim and I took a long walk through the park. I talked to him honestly about drugs. After all, he's 13 and knows kids who use pot at school. Of course, I didn't tell him the details about my past, but we did discuss the important things in life like religion and God and our parents and the future and the war and all the things that kids talk about when they're stoned. It was different and really beautiful. Tim has such a dear, has a, such a clear, decent, honorable outlook on life. I'm glad he's my brother. I'm proud he's my brother. I'm grateful that he will be seen with me. I'm sure it's embarrassing to him because everyone knows I was busted and that I ran away. Boy, have I ever messed up my life. Tim and I can communicate and he says he can pretty well bridge the gap with mom and dad. He is very tolerant about their position as parents and tries to see things from their point of view. He is really a very special person. I wonder how much of his mature outlook I am responsible for. I know he must have done a lot of thinking while I was missing and mom and dad were losing their minds with worry and fear and anxiety. Crap, what an idiot I've been. April 8th. Today, Gran and Gramps arrived. We went to the airport to meet them and I cried like a big boop. They seem to have aged so much and I know I'm responsible for much of it. Gramps is completely gray and Gran's face is lined with deep furrows that weren't there the last time I saw her. Could I have done all that in a month? In the car on the way back, Gramps scratched my back like he used to when I was a little girl and whispered to me that I had only to forgive myself. He's such a nice man and I shall really try, although I know it won't be easy. I must try to make them proud of me again later. I couldn't sleep, so I got up and took a walk around the house. Alex's mother Alex's mother, Kat, just had a batch of baby kittens, and I sat on the porch and just kept looking at them. It was a revelation, without drugs, without anything but kittens, whose fur is like all the softness in the world put together. It was so soft that when I closed my eyes, I wasn't sure I was even touching it. I put the little gray one named Happiness up to my ear and felt the warmth in her tiny body and listened to her incredible purring. Then she tried to nurse my ear, and the feeling in me was so big, I thought I was going to break wide open. It was better than a drug trip, a thousand times better, a million times, a trillion times. These things are real. The softness was not a hallucination. The sounds of the night, the cars swishing by, the crickets. I was really there. I heard it. I saw it, and I felt it. And that's the way I want life to always be, and that's the way it will be.